All right, we'll go ahead and get started. So today we have with us Avril Kumar. Um, Avril is a final year PhD student at UC Berkeley. His research focuses on developing effective and reliable approaches for sequential decision making. Towards this goal, he focuses on designing reinforcement learning techniques to static data sets and understanding and applying these methods in practice. Before his PhD, Avril obtained a BTEC in computer science from IIT Bombay in India. He is a recipient of the CBN Dalek Ramanamurthy Distinguished Research Award, awarded to one PhD student in Berkeley EECS for outstanding contributions to a new area of research in computer science. Um, he's also received a Facebook PhD fellowship in machine learning and Apple Scholars and AI PhD fellowship. Uh, personally, I've been following Avril's work on offline reinforcement learning since 2018. Um, he's a true leader in the field and has been both defining and driving this area with his contributions. Um, I've also had the privilege of collaborating with him on a project, and I can attest to his uh, incredible, uh, exceptional abilities as a researcher, collaborator, and mentor. Um, I'm confident you'll find his talk both informing and engaging, and I encourage you to please welcome me and, and please join me in welcoming our girl too. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for the very kind introduction, Sarv. Um, one disclaimer, I guess uh, this is an RL forum, uh, but this talk that I'm going to present is a CS level talk. So it's a very general talk, but I'm happy to go into detail. So if you find anything is too obvious to you, just let me know and I'm happy to skip to more fun parts. But if not, then this talk is a little too broad at some places, and but it goes into detail. So I'll, I'll, be, I'll make sure to go into details when, when needed. So feel free to just ask any questions in the button. Okay. So uh, I'll talk about reinforcement learning from static data sets. I'll talk about some algorithms. I'll also talk about some analysis and also some applications that I've worked on. So let's start. So, um, oh, I guess I need to click here. Yes. So broadly, there's been like a lot of exciting progress in machine learning recently, right? So we have these amazing generative models now that can generate language and images phenomenally well. And also models that can make predictions about complex objects, such as protein structures, uh, really, really well. If you zoom out a little and look at what enables this, this kind of progress, it has been the standard machine learning paradigms of supervised and unsupervised learning. That what they do is that they take a data set and fit a model to the distribution over inputs in this data set. So this could be the distribution over, let's say, images in a data set, which is what unsupervised learning tries to do, or uh, some kind of conditional density modeling, like supervised learning, where you model the distribution over labels given an image. Now, these kinds of methods of modeling the data have been incredibly successful. And I don't have to go into uh, a, a whole detailed description of what those successes have been, but there, there are still a number of problems where modeling the data in this manner is not fully enough to sort of fully use the potential of machine learning. And to understand what I mean by this, let's look at a more concrete example. So let's say I'm given a certain data set of um, some chip designs. So there are some you know, configurations of chips and uh, this data set is labeled with uh, a number that specifies the runtime it takes to run some particular kind of workload on this chip. So some of these chips can run this workload very fast. So there's a small amount of runtime, where some others could take a long time. So there's a, there's a huge amount of time it takes. With this data set, uh, a very common goal in computer architecture uh, is to develop an ML-based approach to discover a chip that is better than the best chip in this data set. So you want to find a new chip that it attains the smallest possible runtime value. In this problem, it turns out that the standard techniques of supervised and unsupervised learning are not quite enough. Because what you can do is you can make you can train a model to predict runtimes of, of chips, which is what supervised learning would do. Or you could model the distribution over chips in this data set and sample a new chip from that distribution. But neither of these approaches actually allow me to go beyond the data and discover fundamentally a better chip or in an abstract sense, a better decision that attains a, a smaller value of this runtime metric. And that's what we wanted to do in this problem in the first place. That's how the similar sort of goal of discovering sort of decisions that are better than the data comes up in many other domains as well. And in none of these problems, just supervised and unsupervised learning are enough. For instance, in robotics, we want to be able to discover robot policies that can much better and, and smoothly solve a particular task than any policy I know of so far. In healthcare, we want to be able to discover treatment plans that are much that induce much better recovery rates and, and recovery strategies for patients than anything that a doctor has prescribed before. And in scientific discovery problems, we want to be able to discover you know, materials, molecules, et cetera, that have some appealing properties, although none of those would be seen in any data set uh, out there. In all these cases, we want to go beyond the data and supervised and unsupervised learning are not quite enough. 
So how can we solve this question of discovering better decisions? Well, one way to approach this question is to model this, this high level intuition or high level requirement to the problem of optimizing decisions to maximize some kind of a utility function. So the idea is that if I can quantify the notion of being better in terms of a reward or utility function, which I guess I don't need to explain to this audience that much, but if I can do that, then I can simply try to optimize this decision variable with respect to that reward or utility. You know, this, uh, as you probably all know, uh, this sort of a paradigm is uh, very popular in reinforcement learning, Bayesian optimization bandits, and all of those fields try to solve such uh, reward maximization problems. The way these fields typically solve these problems is that they would run some kind of iterated trial and error interaction with a simulator. So for instance, in this game of Go, where uh, reinforcement learning techniques did uh, have a, a very big, did secure a very big win, these methods played this game, uh, played the game of Go millions of times, uh, saw the feedback in the process and learned from that feedback to discover and outperform the best human player on this planet. So clearly these techniques, if they're given enough interaction can work amazingly well and uh, can solve the problem that you started to solve with, which is discovering better decisions. But turns out that when we think about real world problems, um, this exclusive reliance on interaction and, and learning from feedback is a bit problematic. And this is because this exclusive reliance inhibits the ability of these methods to collect lots and lots of data, especially in problems where interaction is expensive or dangerous. So if I imagine a problem such as a problem of drug discovery, it would take uh, sort of millions of years to be able to collect a data set which is millions of size because it takes about one to two months to simply synthesize one data point in a wet lab. Or if you think if I think about embodied robotics or embodied agents more generally, um, if I if, if I'm not controlling interaction properly, interaction would cause safety concerns, which makes it not quite a scalable alternative to collect lots and lots of data, which is what we kind of wanted here. And the reason why I'm stressing so much on data at this point is because data seems to be the crucial ingredient for machine learning success in the modern world. So here's a here's sort of a, a plot from some recently uh, released language models. And, and one thing to, so the only thing I want you to note here is the fact that if you go up on the y-axis and you scale up the kind of data that you're training on, turns out that even very small models can attain very favorable generalization properties, which means data is a very crucial ingredient but these methods that optimize decisions, reinforcement learning methods, are not able to train on that much data because they rely on interaction data alone. Interaction will never allow me to collect data of that much scale because of all the concerns that I talked about earlier. So what can we do? So uh, what I've been doing is to develop methods for optimizing decisions to do reinforcement learning that can incorporate static data sets for solving the problem better. So the idea is that rather than learning by some kind of active or online interaction with the real world, we could take some existing source of interaction data, such as something that already exists in uh, from data logged by robots or data in a hospital's registers, and using this data now to uh, optimize decisions. So this kind of a paradigm, uh, it makes no active queries in the world. So it's an offline learning paradigm. And uh, the, the formalism that I'll talk about today uh, to study this problem of maximizing reward is the formalism of reinforcement learning. So maximizing reward for making a sequence of decisions. And so we'll call this whole uh, paradigm of learning to maximize reward using static data as offline reinforcement learning. So, uh, so my work tackles several facets of this, of this area, and today I'll talk to you about some of them. The first one would be uh, starting with some challenges that come up when we think about trying to do RL from static data. And I'll then discuss some algorithms that I've developed to address these challenges. I'll then talk about some real world applications of these ideas in, uh, that I've worked on in domains such as chip design, robotics, and chemistry. And finally, I talk about uh, sort of something which is much more ongoing, but perhaps also much more interesting in today's uh, era, which is uh, how can you scale these methods up to also enjoy the benefits of large models? That is uh, sort of also sort of a very big ingredient that modern machine learning is benefiting from. So let's start with challenges and algorithms. Um, so I had this slide on notation and terminology because this was meant to be for a general audience. So let's go through it very quickly, um, just so that we, because you probably, you all already know what the notation is. So uh, we'll assume, so the main thing to, to think about here is this existing source of interaction data. And we'll assume that this consists of tuples of four elements. And what these four elements mean, uh, it, they're fairly standard elements, but let me still try to ground it a little bit quickly. So we use Xi to denote the observation or the state of the world that is visible to uh, a particular algorithm. So this is, you know, the state in an RL algorithm. In this example, let's say uh, when the data comes from human drivers driving on the road, this would be the position and the, and the parameters of a car on the road uh, at this at a particular instant in time. 
we'll use AI to denote yes. So are, are you yeah. uh, making a strong assumption that this is a state or is it just an observation? I'm making a strong assumption that this is a state uh, for now. Um, happy to discuss what it means when you don't have a state later. But in this talk, let's assume the state. In the state. Uh, yes, I, the reason why I said this was because for I think for a general CS audience, I, I, I wanted to keep it as simple as possible, but yes, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, we'll use um, action. Uh, uh, we'll use AI to denote the action which is taken by the data collection strategy in the world. So in this case, let's say the car moves forward, so you get an action which takes you forward. R of XIA is uh, sort of a scalar reward value that tells you how good this particular action AI was at this particular state of the world, XI. So this is what the reward function looks like. And XI plus one is the subsequent state of the world or subsequent observation. Uh, I guess as Ben pointed out, they are not the same, but for now assume the observation is the state, and so XI plus one is your next state. So with the data set of these four things, my goal is to solve the standard RL objective, which is I want to find a policy that maps observations to actions, such that if you use this policy to make a sequence of decisions in the world upon deployment, you get a high cumulative reward. So the most general problem setting, but now you only have access to the data set to solve this, uh, solve this optimization problem. Um, now for some um, um, visualizations in today's talk, I'll set I consider the simpler setting where T is set to one. So this is the contextual bandit setting, or if you want to keep it consistent with the current terminology, it's one step of offline RL. And this will be useful for like visualizing some of the ideas, but again, all of the principles apply to the most general setting. I'm happy to discuss what the most general setting also looks like. Okay, so uh, let's talk about what makes offline RL hard. And um, for this, let's start with some intuition. So the intuition for why doing RL from data is hard is because counterfactual estimation is hard. So what do I mean by this? Let's say I gave you a data set of human drivers, um, you know, driving on a road, and I ask you to come up with a policy that can maximize the comfort of a rider sitting in this car. So it's an autonomous car and you want to make sure that the rider has the most comfortable ride possible. To be able to find such an action, to be able to find such a policy, I'll evaluate a set of candidate actions which I could have executed in this car to achieve this particular goal that I want to achieve. This includes some actions that are that will drive the car very smoothly and will maximize the true comfort of the rider, as well as actions which are potentially dangerous, but are candidates of actions that I need to consider in my learning algorithm. So uh, actions that throw the car off the road. Now, the question that comes up in this case is when I'm given access to only human data and none of these candidate actions at all uh, are observed in this human data uh, in my data set, then how can I correctly estimate the outcomes associated with these actions to be able to find a better action? And more importantly, in this process of going away from the data and finding a better action, how do I make sure I avoid the bad actions, which might have catastrophic consequences if I deployed the policy? So this trade-off of like going beyond the data and finding something better, but at the same time, avoiding all unsafe options is sort of the key challenge that comes up because we only have access to a static data set and no ability to query any more new data out there in the world. So um, any, any questions here? Okay, so let me try to sort of, uh, you know, this was a very high level example and you probably are wondering what it has to do with all the, all the technical stuff I introduced. So let's try to narrow it down to a very simple setting where we can visualize some of these ideas, visualize this challenge a bit more concretely. So as I mentioned earlier, this will be the setting of one step offline RL. So the setting where you find, want to find one action so that you can maximize reward, the contextual bandit setting. For visualization, let's assume uh, that the action AI is simply a scalar that I'm going to plot on the uh, on the x-axis. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to visualize the ground truth reward function R of xA for a given x and for all values of a on the y-axis of this plot. So that's the blue line that you see up there. Um, now, in this uh, setting, I just have access to the static data set. I don't have access to the reward function. I only have access to the data set. And that will be shown as these green colored crosses that you see up there. Uh, what I wanted to do, just to recall here, is to find an action that maximizes reward, meaning an action or a distribution of our actions that aligns itself with the mode of this reward function in blue up there. So I want to find that black color distribution that you see up there. So to understand what, why you know challenges come up uh, or what what the challenges, let's start with a very simple recipe one could uh, one could start to apply when you want to solve this problem. And this recipe does something very 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 simple. It takes this data set. And it says, well, in my data set, I only have access to reward values and not the reward function. So what I can do is I can first of all try to fit a model to the reward values in my data set. So I can try to fit a parametric model R theta 
in this case, using supervised learning in the full sequential case, using Q learning or using a dynamics model and a reward function model up to you totally, but you can fit a model to the reward function uh, using your data set. Once you have this reward function, you have the ability to query any possible uh, reward value for any possible action, any possible observation. And so instead of training the policy to maximize ground truth reward, which you do not have access to, you only have access to the data set, you can train the policy to maximize the learned reward models prediction. So R theta of XI here. This is a very simple recipe you can choose to apply to, to, to try to tackle offline RL. And by visualizing what happens in this recipe in our example, we'll understand what the challenge in offline RL tends to be. So let's look at each of these steps in the recipe very closely. So we'll start with step one of understanding what happens to the reward model. So uh, this is our picture from before. Um, and we'll make, a, make some uh, sort of uh, logical statements when we try to learn a reward model. So when we train the reward function, R theta, let's say in this case, using supervised learning, and I have enough capacity of the model, I do cross validation well, et cetera. I'll be able to make sure very likely that this R theta closely matches the ground truth reward in expectation under the data distribution. So this red colored curve that you see up there will closely align with the blue curve inside the, the, the region that is marked by the dashed lines. However, I have no control over how this reward model extrapolates. So this reward model is likely to be incorrect for unseen actions. And uh, more technically, you can quantify this difference as uh, an artifact of distributional shift, where if you train a model on, or if you did empirical risk minimization on some data, you'll not be able to guarantee that uh, the model that you obtain by it is also going to make correct predictions or also going to have is also going to have low loss under a different distribution over the inputs in this case a different distribution over input actions uh, for this picture so once you have this sort of a reward model which has all these crazy peaks outside of the data uh, you can wonder what happens to uh, the second step where you're trying to optimize the policy to maximize the reward model yes then there's something i would consider a first order issue here yeah. i'm not sure how it enters the picture yes but a first order issue yeah, I think in interpreting the data is what your uh, beliefs are about the competence uh -huh. of the demonstrator. Yeah. Does that enter into your formulation here? That's a very good question. Um, it actually um, it actually does um, in the in the. OK, that's a, that's a good point. So. In this particular setting, uh, the, the, the simple algorithm that I'm going to talk about, it doesn't enter. Uh, but I would say that in some ways, um, the algorithms I would talk about, they can be interpreted in some way as a method that has some prior beliefs over what the data is doing and tries to improve over that data, which is probably in some ways getting to what you are talking about, which is... So I suppose yeah. I, I knew that I'm looking at a same driver. Yeah. And his actions are going to be you know, in the top 10 percentile yeah. Yeah. because yeah. he doesn't want to yeah. kill himself, right? Okay. Uh, but do you, do you use that information? So that information explicitly is not used. Uh, and that's because the goal here is different. So in all the stuff that I'll talk about today, the goal is to find a policy that uh, improves upon the data. So sort of the motivation of like, you know, I gave you some drug designs. Can you find me a better drug? Um, the goal is not to be, so uh, what you are saying will be very relevant when you think about it from the context of finding the best possible absolute behavior is what my, my sense. So, but you could say yeah. people are operating at 90 percentile, want to get to the 92nd percentile, but, but knowing it's starting at the 90th percentile. Might be yeah, I, I think we, uh, so that I'm not considering okay. here, but that's a very valid thing and okay. one could consider. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, any other questions? Okay, yeah. So, um, so I was here. So you had this reward model, which has all these peaks. And now we can ask the question of how would uh, policy optimization behave on this reward model? So well, what we can do is we can simply run policy optimization. So we initialize the policy somewhere, run optimization, and very clearly you'll find that the policy finds the peak in this reward model, as you can see up there. Now you have a policy, you'll deploy this policy out there, and you will notice that you get much lower actual reward than what you thought you would end up getting. So you thought you have the best possible action, but in reality, your act, the action taken by the policy is probably worse than the worst action within your data set. So something went wrong, right? We could not find the best action. So it turns out that this problem, you can summarize this in the simple uh, little flow chart. So in step one, the reward model ended up being incorrect on unseen actions, counterfactual actions, distribution shift, all of these terms can be used to explain that phenomenon. And it turns out that those errors get, got exploited by your policy optimization procedure, uh, where your policy was tricked into finding actions that looked pretty promising, but in reality were not promising as you saw in the previous picture. 
So this issue of exploitation is sort of the key issue that comes up when you think about um, doing offline audits from static data because you have no way to verify what unseen actions uh, or what are the predictions of any learned model on unseen actions. Um, you know, you might be wondering if this is just an issue which comes up in these little uh, plots that I drew, or in reality also does this happen? So it turns out that you do find that uh, this challenge is very real and problems such as chip design that I've worked on, robotic manipulation that I've worked on as well, and many other people have also seen this, and also many other areas such as energy management and so on where you're dealing with offline data. So the natural question now to ask is what can we do to address this issue? So uh, there are many algorithms that have been proposed for offline other in the last few years, actually, and some of my own work also tackles developing new algorithms. But today I talk to you about only one of them, which is this paper called conservative Q learning. And before I dive down into the details of my approach, let's look at what prior approaches did at the time when we were doing this work. And for this discussion, again, it will be very useful to keep in mind this recipe of fitting a model of the reward function and then training a policy to maximize this reward model. So what prior approaches did at the time, uh, it's called policy constraint approaches, is to try to tackle this exploitation issue by constraining the policy that you're training to not deviate away from the data set. So the idea is that you tackle the problem of exploitation by, uh, by restricting the policy so that uh, it cannot exploit the reward models errors in step two. Now, this is a perfectly valid idea. And in fact, um, there's a lot of work on, on these kinds of ideas out there. But it turns out that these methods end up being overly restrictive. And this is because these methods assume that the reward model that you trained in step one is going to be totally adversarial to you as soon as you deviate outside the data. So the question that we asked in this line of work was, uh, can we do something different? Can we somehow try to address the shortcoming of the reward model more directly at the level of step one? Like, can we train different kinds of reward models that are not hurtful to step two, rather than trying to think of addressing the symptom of the problem at step two, which these methods do? So to answer that, um, the obvious first question to ask is, when is reward modeling uh, not going to hurt you for offline RL? And for answering this question, we'll start again from this picture that we had before, uh, and we'll do a little thought experiment. So if instead of this model of the reward function, which you see in red here, um, if my model looked like, oops, yeah, this, if my model looked like this, where it always attained sort of low values outside the data, then policy optimization would just work. You know, you don't need to constrain the policy in any way. You will find the right action, which also attains uh, a high ground truth reward, as you can see up there. So what is happening here? Or how can you formalize this condition? So one way uh, to formalize this condition is, or formalize this intuition, is to learn a reward model R theta that somehow satisfies this condition, R theta to be less than the value of R, on unseen actions. So if you can somehow guarantee that your reward model always underestimates the ground truth reward, you're never going to find, you're never going to think that a particular action is really promising unless you can, unless it actually is promising, unless the ground truth value of the reward is also very high. So if you can ensure this, then your problem is, is solved here. But the challenge that comes up now is how do you even ensure this? Because you, know, you don't know what the ground truth reward looks like on unseen actions. So it turns out that if your reward function, the ground truth reward function is smooth or it satisfies some boundedness properties, you can still ensure such a condition. Um, and uh, that's what we try to do in this line of work, which is we try to develop a training procedure that can learn reward models that um, are that underestimate in this particular manner, or you know, what we call conservative models of the reward function. Um, so yeah, so let, let me show you the recipe visually first, and then we'll formalize this and then have it also take more questions about the recipe. So the idea is very simple. We'll start off with this reward model, which with all these peaks outside the data, it's fit to the reward values in your data set. So you can see that the red and blue lines overlap within your data set support. And then what we'll do is we'll simply try to actively mine for peaks in this reward model outside uh, of my data set. Once I have such a peak or a, or a distribution over, uh, over actions that maximizes the reward model's predictions, I'll simply regularize this peak or push its value down. So I'll simply regularize the reward model to not have this peak anymore. You can do this pro process again, so you can find the peak on the other side, uh, push its value down again. And if you do this over and over and you converge, you'll have a model that uh, you wanted in the first place. Um, so it's conservative in the right manner. And now policy optimization would work as you thought uh, it should work. So we'll call this recipe conservative offline model. It's a, it's a very high level principle that I described to you. And the idea is simply to not just fit your data, but also be conservative or, 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 or push down uh, high value unseen actions. So never think that an unseen action is going to give you a really high value, high reward value in this particular example. 
Um, if you want to be a little bit more formal, you can write this down as a minimax optimization problem. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to find R theta um, that fits your reward function, reward values on your data. But at the same time, you are trying to find high value unseen actions or a distribution over unseen actions, which is this inner maximization. And then you are penalizing the expected value of R theta under this adversarial distribution mu. Um, and you are adding this as, with a weight alpha as an objective to train your R theta model. So the idea is essentially you are learning, you're trying to balance out these objectives of fitting the data and pushing down peaks outside of the data, which is what we wanted to do here. Um, this is uh, in spirit. Okay, right. so yeah. Over parameterized case. So yeah. This could go to like negative infinity. Right? Um, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, yes, in principle, there's nothing stopping it from going to negative infinity. Um, although um, technically, like your function class is never so over parameterization is one thing, but there's also the point about like respecting constraints of your function class. So if your function class is only Lipschitz functions, you will not be able to get it to minus infinity necessarily everywhere because you cannot have a you know certain a certain dip in your function right at the bottom of your data. Yeah. yeah, I think you do experimental work too. In your experimental work, what kind of representations do you use for R? That's a great point. So we've just been using uh, simple neural networks, uh, nothing special, just the, the most vanilla thing. Uh, and we haven't found this problem that it goes down to negative infinity, uh, really. Um, but at the same time, uh, obviously, there's the question of like, so one thing which is in there, which is this hyperparameter alpha, this weighting factor that weights of these terms. So you do need the, the weighting factor alpha to be reasonable. Like if you put a 1 million weight there, um, then clearly you will learn a function which is super low. But if not, then it, it, it's fine. So we, in practice, we don't necessarily need to encode any particular condition in there. Yeah. Got it. And where is this uh, regularization term at the end, uh, the formalism for unseen actions coming? Is me with the policy? Right? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So. Um, so uh, here I, uh, you know, this formalism is still a bit imprecise. I, I wrote mu over unseen actions in there in the sense that you can parameterize a distribution over unseen actions. Uh -huh. Now that's very hard to do in practice. You know, over continuous actions, what do you know? How do you know what is seen and what is unseen? So the way it works in practice, which is not there here for reducing the detail for a general audience, but I can tell you here now, the way we do this in practice is we push down, we find views which maximize the reward function anywhere over the space, not necessarily over unseen actions. But we compensate it by pushing up the expected reward value on your data. So if your if your mu aligns with your data, then the two effects of pushing down and pushing up kind of cancel each other. If mu is far away from the data, you push up your data a little bit, but that's okay because all it's doing is effectively, you know, you, you're not just pushing down uh, unseen actions, you're pushing up your data as well. So it has the same effect in some way. So essentially you can, you don't need to quantify the notion of unseen actions in practice. You can just have a formulation which pushes down uh, over any possible action, um, but pushes up on your data. Um, but the principle still is sort of like this, um, or the intuition behind all of these formalism systems. Yeah. Yes. So it seems like you also want to push down like uh, high values for unseen states as well. That's a great question. That's yeah, that's a great question. So um, here, um, I guess. Uh, again, a bit of imprecision on my part, but uh, I've been considering that you uh, assume that X is given to you, let's say, or you have a size distribution over X, or, and this is a one-step problem. You know, there's there's no multiple steps of decision-making. Once you do move to a Q function, I actually have a slide on that, uh, but I can tell right now. So once you do move to a Q function and you're training sequence of decisions, then a difference in, or uh, if you choose an unseen action, you'll go to an unseen state, or maybe even your dynamics will probably go to an unseen state. In which case, um, there is method, there is a method which, does the exact same thing with Q functions, um, but it also searches for unseen states and pushes down the Q and the unseen states. So uh, it's a model-based extension of the same idea, basically. But but for the yeah for this setting, the the contextual banded one-step setting, you don't need to account for the state because you assume for a second it's the same distribution. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, so very quickly. So this is also very similar to adversarial training in spirit, uh, if you think about it, meaning you're trying to find these adversarial examples in your function space, which is kind of like finding unseen actions. And then you're regularizing the model against these unseen actions, which is similar to what adversarial training tries to do. So in adversarial training, you typically have a ball, uh, like an, a particular norm ball around your data point where you're trying to find uh, examples like images, which uh, increase your loss function in this case, it's not exactly the same formalism, but still very similar in spirit of the formulation that we're considering. Okay, so uh, 
so yeah so that that was for the method so now i'll show you some um, uh, high level theoretical intuition of what this method does so i'll try to formulate or try to formalize this intuition that with this sort of a training procedure if you have a sufficiently rich function class um, so sufficiently rich function class for a reward model um, and your reward function that you're using is smooth enough or it's bounded then you can show that with high probability the learned model that you get out of this training procedure will not underestimate will not uh, overestimate the reward values that you train so the theoretical result looks like the following it says if i pick a distribution over actions which is shown like this and i look at the expected value of the learned reward model under this particular distribution this will be upper bounded by the expected value of the ground truth reward um, minus a term that tells you how far away this particular query distribution and your data set distribution over actions is plus a little term that quantifies statistical error so if your data set size is too big that statistical error term will go down to zero quite quickly now the idea is that if you go too far away from your data um, then these last two terms would sum to a quantity that is negative if you choose your alpha which is the the, the hyperparameter on the on the push down term to be large enough so if you're pushing down strongly then you can guarantee that the expected value of the reward function is going to be smaller than the expected value of the ground truth reward that you're training with. Um, there's one key, in, uh, one interesting uh, aspect here, which is the fact that um, this notion of going away from the data is a function of your, uh, or is, is parameterized by your function class of the reward function that you're considering. So what do I mean by this? Imagine for a second that your reward model only depends on the first three dimensions of your action space. In which case, uh, no matter how different are uh, your query distribution and your data set distribution over actions in the other dimensions, the other D minus three dimensions, those things will not affect your divergence metric that shows up here. So in some ways with this procedure, you are accounting for any sort of structure or invariance that comes up uh, when uh, in your reward function class that you know about into your procedure for constraining your, um, your particular you know, distribution to your <laughs> So in some ways, it's like less restrictive than the procedure that I described to you earlier, where you were constraining your policy to be close to the data, because this is aware of the structural assumptions on your function class of your reward model. Okay, so so with this, so once you can show some some underestimation property like this, you can then use it to show guarantees, which are called safe policy improvements. So you can show that the performance of the policy that you trained will always be improving upon the performance of the data or the, uh, the average performance of the behavior policy, the data collection policy, which is the kind of guarantee that I'm, I've been going for in this line of work. Okay, so uh, we already talked about this, but this was all with a reward model, just a one-step problem, but. If you care about uh, cumulative rewards, you can do the same procedure with the queue function. And I'm guessing for this crowd, I don't need to explain what the queue function is, but you get similar sorts of, uh, of, of issues with exploitation and, and they are only much more severe because you are uh, relying on future states which are affected by your current actions as well uh, when you're learning the queue function. But you can use the same procedure, which is fitting the queue function on data, using queue learning, using a model-based approach, using whatever approach you want but you push down high value unseen actions in this queue function. And as uh, you asked, I guess you can also push down high value unseen states if you're using a model-based method. Did you work with Peter Abiel? Yeah. Um, do, do I know Peter Abiel? Did you work with him? Oh, I didn't work with him. Yeah, yeah. This is course project in six RL with uh -huh. me. Uh -huh. was um, uh, how to get pessimistic uh, queue values. Uh, oh, okay. Interesting. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. What was the method the same? No, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, you're 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 much more. Uh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's a, that's very really interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, around two thousand, early two thousand. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, okay, so. Um, yeah, so we call this conservative Q learning um, because you're training a Q function which is conservative or pessimistic in this manner. Um, okay, how am I doing on time? Okay, so uh, okay, so there are some empirical results. So we, uh, I guess, um, you know, when we were doing this work a few months before this, we had released this benchmark called D4RL, which uh, I think some of you might have used potentially. It's a benchmark for for benchmarking offline reinforcement learning methods. So it provides you with a standardized a standardized set of tasks and data sets that you can use. And one of the tasks that was very hard back then was um, this task where you had to essentially train a policy to control a four-legged Mujoko ant robot. So, you know, probably all of you know about this, this domain. Um, and, uh, uh, and the task is to learn a policy to make it navigate from some location to a target goal location in mazes of different shapes and sizes. And you don't have optimal data, so you need to actually do reinforcement learning. You don't have expert trajectories in your data set that you're training with. 
So without going into too much detail, um, you know, prime methods back at the time were not as great, especially when you increase the size of the maze or complexities in the maze layouts. But uh, our method, at least back at the time, conservative queue learning was uh, really good on these tasks and attained a new state of the art on this uh, benchmark. Now this is 2020. Uh, now it's 2023. So there are many new methods that have been that have come up, and these methods are much better than any of the methods that I have here on the plot. But still, um, a lot of these uh, approaches, which are which are really good, they still utilize the basic principle of like conservative training, but use different design decisions. So there's a model-based approach, uh, which uh, someone from Stanford did. Um, there's also a more recent work, which uh, tries to formulate this as a game, as a two-player game, um, and tries to solve the optimization problem. So there's many methods that are out there, which use the same idea, but then use different instantiations, and they work much better empirically uh, on these tasks. Um, OK, so I, uh, I guess maybe this is also something that I don't need to go over for this audience, but you can see there's a gap between imitation learning and reinforcement learning uh, in this in this picture. So there's a, there's a performance gap. So I wanted to talk about why you can actually expect a performance gap from when you're training on static data. And the idea is that, um, or the idea in, in two words is dynamic programming. So when you are in a sequential setting and you have sequences of trajectories given to you, then none of them are optimal, but they have good pieces, uh, you know, optimal pieces, optimal actions. Dynamic programming via Q functions can combine or can learn to combine together the best pieces to find an overall better sequence. So very simple example of this, if you have two trajectories for navigation in your data set, you know, A to D and D to C, um, and you want to find the shortest part to go from A to C, if you were to simply do imitation learning on this data, uh, half the times you'll get the action and be wrong because, you know, in this data, it shows you, one trajectory shows you how to go towards C from B and the other one shows you how to go towards D, uh, which is not optimal. Uh, but with offline RM methods, if you are training a Q function, you can stitch together these parts, uh, A to B and B to C, to find the, the best trajectory 100% of the time. And when you are in an adversarial setting where there's uh, sort of like a lot of overlap between trajectories and there are many junction points or many of these like intersection points, the probability of finding uh, the optimal action, optimal sequence of actions using supervised learning decays exponentially. But with RL, you'll be able to find that uh, with a higher probability. So that's, that's the intuition why. Even though you have a static data set, you can find a better action, better sequence of actions with RL. Okay, so uh, that's the end of part one. And I think I realized I'm also running a bit late, but I don't need to finish my talk. I can, I, I would much prefer an interactive session. Um, so the challenge is this exploitation of overestimation errors that I talked about earlier. This is the main challenge in offline RL. Um, and the way to address this that I talked about is this conservative paradigm. Um, so you train conservative models with the reward function of the Q function. You can also train a conservative dynamics model, actually. Um, and you'd find that empirically this method does perform better because of stitching, because you can, can leverage data and find better actions out of stitching. Okay, so uh, I guess there's been many works that built upon this kind of paradigm, uh, including works and in sort of empirical algorithms and theory, as well as methods for solving other problems which are not offline RL, but you can use the same sort of principle of pushing down to get guarantees and safety and adaptation and robustness type of problems. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the first part. Um, any quick question here? Um, okay, so uh, the second part, which is real world applications. So um, I'll, uh, so I've worked on, so I, or for the last two years, I've been looking at like many application areas uh, where a lot of uh, RL methods can be used, which are outside of sort of more conventional areas such as robotics. And a few of them that I've been looking at uh, include things such as chip design. So this is the example that I gave to you earlier. Um, more formally, it's called accelerator design. So here our goal is to synthesize chips that can run specific kinds of workloads really, really quickly um, for a given application. I've also done work in robotics that is somewhat more conventional, but here our goal was to take a large data set of robot behavior and use it to extract a uh, good policy initialization for learning downstream tasks on a robot. And also more recently, I've been looking into problems in computational chemistry. So um, here's one example. Uh, the goal here is to find uh, or discover the lowest energy stable lattice structure. So you want to optimize the lattice structure of a, of a chemical uh, when you only have access to its chemical formula and a data set of some other chemicals and potentially suboptimal lattice structures for those chemicals. So the common point in all these problems is that uh, it's very hard to build simulators. So in the accelerator design case, uh, you, it, a very high fidelity, fidelity simulator takes about 10 to 11 days to run a simulation. Whereas uh, you have access to data, which is already logged from, from prior experiments, which have been done by domain experts in all these cases. 
So there's a very favorable uh, argument for why you can use to you can use data and convert it to optimal decisions or good decisions, good actions, which is why offline R is a very well suited paradigm to solve these problems. Um, I was going to go into uh, the details of the accelerator design application. I'll tell you what the problem statement is and flash the results, but I'll probably go into the, the third part, which is perhaps more interesting for, for this audience. But uh, at a high level, sort of the idea here was um, you want to synthesize the, the architecture for an, for an accelerator or a chip. So you want to dictate how many cores you want to put on a chip, how much memory you want to put on a chip, et cetera, such that if you were to run a specific kind of workload on this chip, so this is a particular, um, you know, particular ML application you want to run on this chip, the runtime of running this workload should be minimized. Or in other words, you wanted to maximize the negative runtime of running this, this workload on the chip. So in RL terminology, the, um, the chip is the action, um, the, the workload is the observation, and this is a single step problem or a contextual bandit problem where the reward is the negative runtime. Uh, and we had access to data which consisted of tuples of, of this form. Um, where did this data come from? So this, data, this project was done in collaboration with Google. So they had data which was, which was logged for, certain, for testing certain accelerator designs for certain workloads uh, and measuring what the runtime looks like. But the key thing to note here is that not all of these tuples were good, meaning you could not simply do supervised learning or imitation learning because there were accelerators which were terrible for running the particular workload that we considered here. Um, and our goal was to find the best accelerator or the best action for a set of unseen or new states that you that you that you are considering for this problem. So we found that our method, which was just using data, gave rise to much better accelerators, so much lower runtime, and uh, the biggest benefit, I think, in my opinion, is the fact that you don't need simulation anymore. So the only part of simulation we needed here was to simply evaluate our designs, evaluate our proposed accelerators, which was about 10 to 11 hours. Whereas for simulation, if you're simply running simulation and search in the simulator or an online RL, if you were to call that, it would take about 10 to 11 days and still find a worse uh, point, worse accelerator than our method. Yes. So... Yeah, so the data was uh, was basically given to us. We also tried uh, a version where we tried randomly sampling from the search space and collecting data. Both of them give you very similar results, but the data here was basically logged in the system. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, and uh, this part, I guess you can you can actually look at the designs and find that they do have some interesting properties, such as they align with the kind of workload you you are considering uh, for your problem. Uh, but I'll skip this in more detail. Um, okay, so I'll, and people have utilized these ideas for domains such as healthcare, um, where, uh, again, the goal, as I mentioned, is to find a treatment strategy that may, uh, so typically in healthcare, you care about finding treatments that may lead to faster recovery, but the problem that was being considered by this paper, this is, I'm not an author on this paper, but this is a paper for someone else. They're considering the problem of finding treatments that may increase chances of fatality later on. Uh, so this is called dead-end detection in, in, in healthcare. And they found that if you utilize uh, existing data of patients and run conservative methods for RL on that data, uh, you can get up to 15% improvement in, in the problem of sepsis, uh, in the problem of dead-end discovery for sepsis detection. And also these methods are, are deployed in notification systems at LinkedIn um, to about 100 million people where they are basically the used for policies that dictate when you should send out a notification versus when not to send out a notification. Okay, so uh, I'll talk about the third part, uh, which is perhaps, um, yeah, uh, let, let's see how much we can cover, but I, I think I should be able to finish it. So, um, uh, yeah, so uh, the third part is about how can we take these methods and scale them up to enjoy benefits of large models. And uh, the reason why this is interesting is because, you know, I started my talk with this plot and I talked about how large data sets with language models can give you great performance. But the second thing, which is very important in this plot, is the large model aspect. Which is, if you have a data, you have if you have data of a given size, then the second aspect that you want to exploit is increase your model size so far so that you can get the benefits of scale, so that you can get emergent good properties in your learned model. With offline RL methods, I talked about how you can leverage large data sets. Uh, you know, you can take data and convert it to a policy. But the natural next question, if we were to uh, think about this whole problem space in the form of these two axes. Is to think about how what can you do to take these offline RL methods and make them enjoy the benefits of having large model architectures. Now, this is not quite clear whether these methods can already benefit from large models that exist out there. And so, to understand that, um, not me, but actually others uh, tried to do a large scale experiment. 
And this experiment was done in a domain, uh, which is very popular in RL, which is something which RL methods are supposed to exceed on or excel on uh, in general. So the domain is of Atari games. And the task here is not to train on each of these games individually, which is what people typically do, but rather to train one single policy to play all 40 Atari games together. So uh, here, this is a much more challenging task because you have to distill behaviors for potentially conflicting games into one possible network. And to add on to that, you here you have a lot more data. So you have 2 billion data points given to you in your offline data set, which at least according to me is much larger than any data set I know of. Um, and the data is highly suboptimal, uh, but you want to be able to recover good game playing policies on these tasks. So uh, on this problem, if you look at scalability, meaning performance improvement that happens when you improve or increase the model size of the training algorithm, you'll find that if you do supervised learning or you know, variations of imitation learning, basically, you'll find that the performance improves a lot when you scale up model size. So when you go from a smaller model to a larger model. But with uh, these Q learning style methods, these offline RL methods that I talked about so far, you'll find that performance uh, increase when you go from a small model to sort of a bigger model is much more modest, much, much smaller. And turns out that if you increase model capacity a lot, uh, the performance starts to decrease. Um, so you'll find performance for a smaller model to be larger than performance for a larger model. And uh, it's not at all clear why this should be the case, because technically on this problem of Atari games, we should have known all the tricks you need to get RL methods to work, because these, these are these are domains or these are games where RL methods were, or Q learning side methods were developed for the first time. So we had this question of why it is hard to use large models for, for offline RL. And we wanted to sort of understand this from a mental model perspective. So put, a, put some understanding of what is happening exactly when this goes bad. But answering this question in isolation is very hard because many things can go bad here and we don't know which of these factors are uh, actually the primary cause of the problem. So what we did was we tried to narrow it down to the question of understanding why it is easy to use large models in the case of supervised learning. The idea is that if you can explain why la large models help in supervised learning um, and take that explanation and, and try to figure out what breaks in the case of offline RL by backtracking, we can perhaps have a better shot at answering this kind of a question. Now, uh, one of the models which exists out there for understanding why large models work well in supervised learning is this theory of implicit regularization. And this is something that uh, has been studied a lot in the deep learning community uh, for the last few years. And in a nutshell, the theory says this, this the theory says something like this. It says, if you're trying to train uh, an over-parameterized network uh, or an over-parameterized over model, let's denote its parameters by theta, uh, and you're minimizing a supervised loss function, such as mean squared error or cross entropy error, but you do this via stochastic gradient descent from a particular initialization, then turns out that you don't end up finding solutions that minimize this loss, but you end up finding solutions that minimize a regularized version of this loss. And this regularizer is not something that you add to the training, but it's just uh, something that comes up or it's implicitly induced as a result of your optimization algorithm. So as a result of SGD being used in this picture. Now, this implicit regularizer, uh, if you write down uh, the, the, if you compute this exactly, you'll find that this implicit regularizer typically prefers sort of simpler or regularized solutions, like minimum norm solutions that tend to generalize better in, in, in practice. So there's no theoretical answer of why this implicit regularizer should always help in supervised learning, but at least an empirical answer that it works well and it's, it sort of intuitively makes sense. So what we tried to do then in this line of work was that if we have this theory of implicit regularization um, explaining potentially why supervised learning works well with large models because this implicit regularizer is good, then what if we, what if we try to backtrack away and look, like, look at what implicit regularizer looks like for the case of offline RL? If we can write that down, potentially we can look at what the differences are and what that tell us about large models and RL that we wanted to start off in the first place. So I'm gonna uh, describe to you a little theoretical result and I'll probably not discuss the intuition for it, but happy to discuss um, or not discuss the proof for it. I'm happy to discuss that later on. So the idea, uh, so the, before going down to this theoretical result, I'll just put one bit of notation. So we'll assume we are training a neural network now and I'm gonna denote the last but one layer output of this neural network as phi theta and we call this features of the network. So uh, what we showed, uh, well, and, and I guess the, 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 the reason why it, 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 it is expected to be different in the case of RL is because in RL, typically you don't train your model to regress to static targets like mean squared error in supervised learning, but rather you, you train your, your neural network, in this case, Q theta, 
to regress to target values that are dependent on your model. So this is bootstrapping for those of you here who are familiar with this term. Because of this difference, there's a difference in this kind of regularizers that you get because the loss function looks fundamentally different. In one case, you're chasing moving targets. In the other case, you're not. So um, more concretely, uh, the regularizer for the case of supervised learning prefer solutions with a low norm of this feature vector. So a low norm of this phi theta that you train uh, in your network. And this is not my result. This is somebody else's result that we took from uh, this, this paper that is cited up there. If you redo this analysis uh, while accounting for some adjustments for the case of offline RL, you'll find that because of this difference in the, the kind of targets that, you are, that you're using for, for supervised learning, which is a fixed target, and with RL, which is a moving target, you find that the regularizer is now much more complex. So the first term in this regularizer is still the same as in the case of supervised learning. It's still a term that prefers solutions with a low feature norm. But there's a second term in this regularizer for RL, which um, first of all has a negative sign in front of it. So imagine if you were minimizing this regularizer, um, then you are maximizing this, this second term. And uh, note that the second term at a very abstract level looks like a dot product between two feature vectors. So it's phi theta xi ai transpose phi theta xi plus one ai prime i plus one. Which means that if you're trying to maximize this term, you're trying to sort of blow up the lengths of these vectors that show up in there. Meaning you're trying to maximize the length because that's an easy way to maximize this dot product. So, yeah. There's two thetas in the second term. Yeah. Um, is one of them like a target value that's fixed when you're maximizing? That's a good question. So uh, uh, one of them, so for, for this thing, just consider the, the standard TD setting, not the fitted Q iteration setting. So in this case, yes, it is coming from the target network. But it's the same parameter. Like the first one, mm -hmm. what you're tuning, the second one fixed. Or? So um, for a second, if you if you imagine the TD setting where you keep where you keep Q theta, um, there's only one network Q theta that you use for committing the targets and you regress onto that. Th then the two thetas are the same. If you're considering the fitted Q setting, then the thetas would be theta and theta target. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions here? Okay. So the second term, um, basically, it's trying to like somehow increase the, the lengths of these vectors because that's what is appearing in there, whereas the first term is trying to reduce the lengths of these vectors. So in some ways, these two terms have a conflicting effect with each other, and inevitably that will drive us towards solutions that are different than the supervised learning case because supervised learning just is trying to reduce norms. Now, this itself doesn't tell you why this is a bad thing, but uh, I'm happy to discuss later on why this is particularly bad because the, the action A prime I plus ones that are in there in that expression come from the learned policy. So if you're in the offline setting, you have no control over the learned policy um, and the features for unseen actions potentially, which your learned policy can take. But happy to discuss that later. But the idea for now is that there is a term that is very different from the case of supervised learning. So then our hypothesis was, well, if this term can be potentially bad or can take us can make us be different from supervised learning, what if we try to simply uh, offset this term? What if we simply try to add back this term into a practical algorithm? Um, so add back this term as an explicit regularizer to a practical algorithm, and then see whether we can scale now, whether we can benefit from whether we can benefit from large models now. So we did exactly that, um, and turned out that in practice, this led us to uh, uh, using offline RL methods from the first part, so conservative Q-learning, um, plus this regularizer now uh, gave us the same kind of scalability benefits on this problem that I described earlier. And not just this, but if you look at more uh, sort of absolute results, um, you'll find that if you take CQL and use large ResNet models, as well as combine this regularizer now, uh, you find that from the best performing method previously, you can improve by a lot. And this is sort of the first time where uh, we were able to surpass the performance of data on this problem. So if you have bad data, you know, best prior methods based on imitation learning would perform worse than the best possible trajectory in the data set. But our method was able to do better, which is kind of what is expected if you can do dynamic programming, Q-learning properly. Uh, in this case, it was blocked by using a large model, but now with this regularizer, we were able to do that well. So uh, what I'm talking about here is not so much that this is the way to approach all scale scaling problems in RL. But it tells us the fact that you know while large models can hurt in offline RL, and certainly offline RL has a very different optimization behavior than supervised learning, so that simply even writing down the mental models or mental pictures of how optimization behaves in over parameter settings, in deep settings, et cetera, and looking at what the difference between RL and supervised learning is can give us already an approach for developing methods for RL that do actually scale well in practice. 
So I'm not saying this is the end of the story, but this is this suggests this hints at a good possibility of like looking at looking back at uh, understanding super looking back at what we've understood about supervised learning and using it to make RL much better, which is what this line of work sort of hints at. So that was it for the things I wanted to talk about. Well, it's just on time. Um, I had some slides about what extensions you can do, but I, I guess maybe I'll stop and take questions more uh, and have you talk about other things later. Yes. Um, so how important is it to get the exact form of the regularization from uh, right? I wonder if you just do a naive regularization as um, support. That, that's a great question. I've gotten that question multiple times as well. So we tried um, some simple things like weight decay, um, trying to put any even, um, you know, things like their normalization there. So we are not regularization, but like just uh, architecture tricks. And uh, at least on this problem, like on the Atari problem, we found that it does seem to, so on a, on a, on a smaller version of this Atari problem, we did find that this actually helps a lot more than those other approaches. Uh, this spectral normalization, which is a very big thing in literature, but we have always found that it doesn't seem to help that much. Um, I don't have a have a great answer of why those things don't help. I, I guess I guess I presented an answer for why this thing should help, but um, at least in, on on these Atari style of problems, it doesn't seem like those things help really. But yeah, yes. I'm just uh, I was thinking about like, the intuition of the second yeah. Does, yeah. does it have to do something related to like how the uh, in Q learning you aggregate the rewards over time? So uh, yes, so that's a good point. So I was hoping to cover this in a little bit more detail, but I think I uh, I did not save my slides. But uh, but yeah, so the, the reason why the second term comes up is because you are training to match targets under your Q function. So if you compute your if you use your Q function to compute a target value for training your Q function again, which is what you typically do in Q learning, um, the second terms inputs are what show up in that second term of the regularizer. Um, so I guess at a high level, yes, the intuition is true that you are aggregating rewards and that's why you're getting it. But the important point here is that you're not aggregating rewards by computing a target value. You're aggregating rewards by using your learned model to make predictions for the target value that you're then using for training. So because of that, you get the second term, essentially. So the end here yeah. is the learning horizon. So n here is simply the data point. So I going from one to n is uh, the data set that you're training on. So this is all remember in the offline setting, right? So you have a data set of xi ai xi plus one. Yeah. Maybe was doing like some smaller data, like ID or one. So uh, that's a good. So this thing doesn't quite depend, or this formula as written doesn't quite depend on the distribution of inputs or being iid or not. Um, yeah, I don't think it depends. I don't think the proof either depends. I think it just depends on the fact that you are summing up over your data set. So in an over parameter setting, if you have enough parameters than the data, then technically you are thinking about your data points and not your data distribution or data or data points coming IID from a given distribution. Um, so I don't think this depends on on the on being on the IID assumption, but uh, I think I'm like 97, 98 percent sure about that, but I can check again and see. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, any other questions? Okay, yeah, I guess then uh, I can tell you a little bit about what we have been doing, um, you know, besides this, uh, you know, what can you do more, more recently? So there, I, I, according to me, there are like interesting questions about like, you know, using unlabeled data um, in, in RL. So uh, we've done some initial work on like taking these offline RL methods and thinking about how can you learn skills, how can you leverage unlabeled sources of data? So if I don't have reward values, what can you do with it? Then somebody you can take very similar algorithms and, and throw data at it with labeled with R min or minimum possible reward. And that at least does something sensible, not the best method, but does something very sensible in practice. Uh, we've also been looking at questions along ease of use. So um, this is something also that I think is a very big open area for research. So thinking about how do you cross validate these algorithms? How do you tune hyperparameters for a lot of these algorithms? Turns out that this is a this is sort of a, an unsolvable problem in the worst case. But thinking about what structures you can bring in and under what conditions can you do this properly or feasibly is sort of a big question that comes up. And the thing to me that seems missing from a lot of literature in this line of work is the fact that they don't account for the the dynamics of your learning algorithm. So if you are training a particular offline RL algorithm, it will behave in a particular way for certain same choices of hyperparameters. Can we bring that intuition into our our, our 
cross validation strategy or a strategy for tuning methods um, is something that is not quite there out uh, out there. You've done some initial empirical work along this axis, but certainly like way more things to go. And also, you know, so far I talked about fully the offline setting, but in some ways, like the benefit of RL is coming from the fact that you can collect your own data and improve upon it. So there is uh, some work that we did recently about thinking thinking about what can you do um, to make online policy improvement feasible with these methods. So can you think of offline RL as like an inner element, inner loop? in a bigger system which collects its own data and what challenges come up there and how can you fix it? So I don't have time to go into that, um, but you know, you know, there's some inter interesting questions, very much open questions along these sort of axis of like supervision, ease of use and adaptation. And the reason why I've been thinking about this is because it seems like these questions along with learning from offline data sort of help us devise a, a wholesome sort of decision-making system that or a workflow for decision-making that practitioners can use for solving a wide variety of problems where they want to apply RL, which is kind of what I want to get to in the next few years. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I was talking about. So this RL toolbox, a toolkit for practitioners to use reinforcement learning um, in a proper way. Uh, but yeah, I guess I'll end at that. Uh, thank you so much for, for listening and more questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay.